Oh, wow. Okay. It's already three past. Why don't I go and get started? We've got a short list of people today. All right. Um, let's see. Clemens and Rachel, you guys did your action items. Thank you guys very much for doing that. Um, even though it's later on, since it's on my head right now. Uh, when I, Clemens' action item was to make sure that there was a, a call set up today to discuss PR 218 and the topics around that. Uh, I believe it's at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, it's using the same Zoom call as this one. So if you want to join in the conversation, please remember to join that. Uh, Rachel's action item result is on the agenda today, so we'll get to that later. All right, uh, community time. Is there any community-related topics people would like to bring up? I don't see anybody new on the call, so I'm guessing no. Okay, not hearing any, keep moving forward. Okay, SDK subgroup. Um, we did have a call right before this one. I don't think there's anything earth shattering worth mentioning. I'll just check the notes here very quickly. Um, yeah, I, 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 Clement is gonna write up some guidance around the um, MIME type uh, possible confusion, or for lack of a better phrase, around the, the batching stuff that, that the batch stuff introduced. So keep an eye out for that PR to come in soon. But other than that, yeah, I don't think there's anything That's not all though, we had two points. Oh, what was the other one? I can't remember. The other one was the uh, um, the serialization guidance for for the binary mode. Ah, okay. Um, in short, in short terms, um, there was uh, a an issue raised on the C sharp SDK where um, the C sharp SDK did not does not magically turn a an object graph into JSON in binary mode. And that's intentional because the assumption is that you bring either a readily string encoded data or binary encoded data, and that's being put into the payload because the encoder that we have is not really for the payload, but it's for the envelope. So, so just you know, by the way, also using that for payload encoding doesn't seem right, and specifically not for the binary mode. Right. Okay. So I'll I'll flesh it out in that guidance, then we can go and discuss it. Yep, sounds good. Thank you, Clemens. Um, let's see, that was the SDK. I don't see Kathy on the call, and I don't think anything happened with the workflow subgroups, nothing you mentioned there. So, Scott, on the proposal for the next demo, I, I apologize, I did not get a look at this to see if there are updates here, but is there anything you would like to mention here? I think some people may have commented on here. Um, was there anything worth mentioning, Scott, from your perspective? Uh, no, there's, there hasn't been a lot of interest, maybe parties, so maybe we need to think of another demo if uh, it doesn't pique the interest of people. Um, I'm trying to think the best way to sort of force that discussion. Do you think it would be best to set up a separate call or just schedule time, say, on next week's call to discuss it at, that, at this time? I could be, I'd be happy with a, a demo call if we want to do that. Call. Okay. Let me go ahead and take the action item to set that up. I'll probably do a doodle poll then to find a good time. Um, then people can opt in if they want to participate or not. You know? Right. Okay, cool. Anything else on that one people would like to bring up? All right, we already talked about the call later today. Uh, okay, KubeCon, CloudNativeCon EU. Um, we should probably start thinking about who is going to be giving a talk during our intro and deep dive sessions and you know what the various topics were. I, I think the intro is probably pretty much what we've done in the past. It, this is for newbies who pretty much know nothing about us. So we could probably use a lot of the same material there. I do think there's gonna be more opportunity for, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? For new stuff or invention in the deep dive section because we'll have newer things in the spec to talk about or potential other exciting things just to mention there. So I think that might be where the more interesting area lies. But we should probably first start talking about one, who's going and then would of that set, who would, be, who would want to actually be part of those presentations. So let me sort of open the floor up and see if someone wants to sort of raise their hand to get added to the list. I'll probably go. Okay. Hey Doug, would it make sense to have a cloud events booth? A cloud events booth? You mean like on the, showroom floor like where all the companies live yeah like have a have the uh, interrupt demo 
constantly happening on the floor? Uh, that's an interesting question. What do, other, what do other people think? I guess there's two aspects. So one is, do we think it's worthy enough, put it that way, but then also I would need to check with Dan Kahn and the CNCF guys to know whether quote sandbox projects are allowed to be that, that prominently featured. It's a different issue. Um, but what do the people think? Is this something you guys would want to pursue? My main concern is money. Don't you pay a lot of money to get a booth? Probably, yes. Yeah, this is Ginger uh, with Senadio. For, uh, to get a booth at one of the KubeCons, you have to be part of the um, CNCF membership and Linux Foundation membership. So, and that costs a decent amount of money. Yeah. I can buy a table, it's oh. no problem. <laughs> <laughs> can you set up a brownie table too and put brownies on there and sell lemonade at the same time? Uh, so, so tell you what, Scott, uh, let me, I'll, let me, if it's worth at least asking whether it's even possible, I suspect that the, the folks who mentioned this are already probably correct. It probably would require a fair amount of money, which I don't know if anybody's willing to put forward. But the other aspect that I'd actually be concerned about is this, like I said, worthy enough to actually be there 24-7 on the, on the booth floor. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, I you're probably right. And, and a lot of the vendors already have a booth, so maybe we can just have a coordinated demo in each vendor booth. Yeah, that might be possible. Okay, so based upon what I'm, okay, so, okay, so the, if nothing else, then I'll ask Dan and, and wait for him to come back and give me an answer, even though it's probably going to be no without money. Um, but relative to my original question of who might actually want to present, um, so Christoph, I have you, Scott, I have you, Clemens, are you, Vlad, I wasn't clear whether you were raising your hand to potentially talk or you're just saying you're going to be there. I help on to talking. I don't know exactly about what, but sure, I know. Okay. Um, I would, I would do a talk. Yeah. Well, okay. So yeah, we we should probably well, first let me gather the list of people, and then we can have another call or a different discussion to figure out what we want to do there. Because one of the things that I'd like to do is um, give an opportunity for newer folks or uh, other people to present. So, for example, I, Clemens, you and I presented. Um, so. Okay. We, so maybe best if we st stood back a little and let some other guys do it if they wanted to, but we can figure that out later. Sure. Um, but we'll see. So, okay, so I have those, those four people. Um, actually, I'll put my name in there too because I'm willing to talk if necessary, but we'll see. Okay, so think about it. If you guys wanted to, uh, to potentially talk and you'll be there, let me know. Otherwise, what I'll do is I'll set up another call um, not in the not too distant future because people need to start making planning uh, arrangements and stuff like that um, and get permission. And obviously being one of the speakers can help with uh, approvals from your company. So I'll set up a call for us to talk about that. All right. Um, uh, will we have uh, two sessions like we had at the one in Copenhagen or yes. we not know the structure yet? Yes, we will definitely have at least the intro and deep dive. Whether there's an additional session there I think that's up to whether you're speaking, whether someone submitted a, a call for a proposal around it and whether it gets accepted or not. Now, having said that, I just remembered, um, oh, I'm dying a blank. Um, Chris, Chris Anichuk, pasted a message to our Slack channel saying that they're thinking about doing some sort of serverless conference thing. I can't remember the exact phrase he used, at KubeCon EU. Yeah, I, I can't remember if it's a half day or full day thing. I think it may be a full day thing. Um, so that may be another opportunity for us to present what we're doing there. I don't know exactly what's going on, so I may be completely wrong, but that may be an opportunity there as well. So I'll, I'll try to get more information about that as, uh, as we go forward. That may be another opportunity. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else relative to KubeCon uh, EU that people need to, uh, they want to bring up that we should be talking about? All right, moving forward then. Compliance testing. So Scott, you mentioned this one. Um, you want to sort of summarize what your question was, even though it's pretty obvious? Yeah, but I would like to propose that we start developing an uh, on-the-wire conformance test to verify that the, each SDK can speak to each other. And maybe, you know, if, if another vendor has a, a library, be able to test it against what the spec says is good. 
Okay. Now I know that in the in the section of our of our um, of our repo, we do have sort of an open source section with a list of open source implementations. And I know I think there's at least one or two sort of cloud event verification tools in there, so that might be a good starting point for us to consider. Um, but I'm assuming you're probably uh, thinking of something a little more formal than just someone puts a thing out there, right? Are you thinking about like hackathon type events as well, or just some sort of hosted thing that people can hit against? What, yeah, did you have any thoughts on that? I actually, I didn't know about that list. Uh, which repo is that in? I think it's an R repo. Let me just double check here. Oops. DB. Um, yes, I think it's an R repo. Or maybe it's another community. Open source MD. So uh, there's this one. I thought there was another one. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, I think this one might be a little bit old. I don't think it's up to the latest version of the spec. Um, I think the last I heard or talked to that person, they were in the, they were thinking about doing it, but they haven't done it yet. I thought there was more than one though. But anyway, if you want to sort of flesh out, not necessarily too deep because I don't want to put too much work on you, but if you could like jot down what you're thinking relative to the, to the compliance testing, um, then we could take the next steps from there. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, cool, thank you. All right, moving forward on to PRs. Fabio is not on the call. However, we talked about this one last week and I think we were generally okay with it, but there was one question because I think he had on, oh, just refresh, refresh his memory. What he wanted to do was to modify the, what is this, the Swagger doc um, to give minimum length to all of our strings and at one point, he actually had a constant here of 0 0.2, and I can't remember who it was, but somebody pointed out that that means you can't support anything but 0 0.2, and that's, that'd be problematic for forwards and backwards compatibility. So he ended up removing that. I think other than that, there was, that was the only change he made. So are there any other questions or concerns about this one? Because we almost approved this last week, except for that one comment. All right, any objection to approving them? All right, cool. Thank you, guys. All right, Christoph, number one. Actually, let me ask you, Christoph. Is this the order you'd like to go through yours, or does it not matter? Um, I don't. I've, no, it doesn't matter really. Okay, <clears throat> let's just take them in order then. All right. We do. Uh, what changed since last time on this one? I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> me neither. Um, or, um, since last time, and not a lot, I think uh, Clemens made a few uh, small suggestions, uh, which I implemented, but nothing major, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So, does anybody have any questions for Christoph on this one? Do people need more time? to review this one. I think this is a great proposal, Christoph. Thank you for putting it together. I really like it. Yeah. I did the implementation of it and um, the only thing, and that's one of the things I'm gonna go and put into the uh, SDK notes is that the new um, uh, media type that we're defining here for the uh, format is, um, um, has there's a risk, uh, there's a, a bug risk here, which is not too grave, but uh, it's an easy bug to make because the cloud event application slash cloud events is a prefix of application slash cloud events batch. And um, since we're using these suffixes for the actual format, um, uh, my implementation in the beginning did a, um, an, a check whether the message is a cloud event by, by doing a starts with application cloud events without including the plus character. And that would have matched the batch as well, which would have been wrong. And so I have to go and correct that. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to write up two sentences about this for the SDK note so that um, nobody makes that mistake. 
Um, but that's really the only thing I found. Otherwise, from a factoring perspective, since we're now moved that into the uh, um, into the JSON spec, the JSON now JSON has effectively a batching model that HTTP does. Um, that's really where it lands is um, you know distinguishing the messages by um, the the media type, and then really dealing mostly with the JSON decoding and not with uh, um, anything that's HTTP specific. Really, the HTTP specific piece is. Uh, touching and evaluating the content type. So that's the right the right model. So for me, that is good and we should go merge it. Okay. Any other um, comments or questions? Oh, go ahead, Christoph, sorry. Type, um, I mean, we can also call it batched cloud events if that makes it better. I don't mm -hmm. have a strong opinion on it. Yeah, it's funny, as we were talking in the SDK call about this, it, I can see the fact that it, the the start of it matches. I'm oh, sorry. It starts with cloud, application cloud events. Can actually be a good or a bad thing, um, right? Because if you just want to find all cloud events, geez, wouldn't it be nice to only have to search the beginning part of the string? Um, but then, if you only care about non-batch, you have to go a little further and check one more character. So that's interesting. Because you get yeah. that. Yeah. So I did I put a couple of comments in here. I think things like content type, I think needs to be changed to data content type. Um, I had one other question in here. You have any comments on the, uh, this one, Christoph? Yeah, I tried to um, make this a part of the JSON format in that I said, but I'm not 100% sure um, what I'm trying to say, there's the JSON event format and there's the JSON batch event format. And those are technically completely separate things. I mean, logically they're very similar, but when we say JSON event format, we mean the non-batch one. And when we say JSON batch event format, we mean really the other thing. <clears throat> one thing to make it even clearer will be to split it up into two files, but I'm not sure if that is a step too far. And if you have any other idea how to make the distinction really clear, I'm all up for it. I generally agree that the distinction should be clear. But it's not, it's not really separate because it, one embeds the other. Yeah, I know. But in terms of, um, if you look at, here's a list of event formats that I support, then these are two different things. One builds on top of the other, but in terms of like, yeah, mime type or whatever, they are different. Yeah, uh, but I still, I still think it's okay to have them all in one file. So but I also think so. That's why I put it in one <laughs> file um, because they are so similar. Yeah. So am I correct in assuming that we want to, well, okay, the wording here, I believe, says you have to support the, the, the traditional JSON format, but you do not have to support batched, right? And if so, is that what we want to say? Or do we want to force people to also support batched? Personally, I don't want to force everyone to use the batched mode. Um, if we take the uh, function as a service, as an example, um, you have the model, you get an HTTP request that should run on a single instance of a function, process the event, and then be done. So you kind of have the model that a single HTTP request should model to one event. Once you make a batch of events, um, then this model breaks. So this is one good reason why I don't think I want to force everyone to do batching. Okay. Especially in context of uh, serverless. Okay. <clears throat> so then what, what I'd like to do is, I'll, I'll go back and think about it, but I'd like to probably modify this paragraph ever so slightly to make it perfectly clear that this must only applies to the JSON format. I mean, I know it, it literally says that, but the problem is I think people will very quickly confuse the batch JSON format with the normal JSON format and think they have to support both. And so I'd like to augment the symptoms just to make that clear. I'm not, not gonna change the semantics. I just wanna make it clear that we're only talking about the one format, if that's okay. Sure, okay. let's do that. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions or comments on this proposal? 
So aside from those editorial tweaks, um, is there anybody on the call who would object to adopting this? I'm not necessarily calling a vote. What I'm, what I'm trying to tease out is whether anybody would like more time to review this because you guys are awfully quiet today. So do people want more time to look this over or do they basically think, nope, it's good to go and it's just editorial tweaks at this point? This is Roberto, it looks really good to me. Okay, thank you, Roberto. Anybody else want yeah, to chime in? Yeah, I think it's fine. Like, I'm, like, quiet is a sense. Okay, just, just want to make sure. I, I can never sometimes tell whether it's, I agree and I don't need to say anything, or I just don't give a crap, so, that's, <laughs> so this is good. Thank you for speaking up. Okay, so let's go with this. Um, so I, I believe that, let's see, where is it? I think there are a couple of spots that have to be data content type. I think those are obviously very, like typo kind of things. What I'd like to do is treat the tweak to this sentence as editorial. Um, but so what I'd like to do at this point is ask for approval conditioned upon that editorial tweak. And then once I get say two LGTMs offline, we can then merge it in. But that's all predicated on the fact that you guys approve this as it is today with the agreement of those minor editorial tweaks. So is everybody okay with that? Yes, I am. Okay. Anybody else want to speak up? Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, guys. So, so I'll get going. Uh, I want to mention a, a quick thing that came up in the discussion of this um, that's in the uh, um, discussion about the uh, format. And I think it's not in the inline comments, but more on the, I think you can better see it the, on the other page, yeah. Um, there was a suggestion about a different shape of, or if you scroll a little bit further down. Oh, oh, Doug made a comment, yes, right? There, yes, there, there, uh, uh, further up. Oh, was it further up? I missed it. Oh, there it is, yes. Thank there you. it is, yes. Um, which is, which is, um, Effectively, if we wanted to, if we want to go and send time series data, and we say um, the time series is um, all encoded as as with cloud events metadata, which means every single time event record is a cloud event per se. Um, then, um, for you know industrial data, etc., those batches can become very large, um, and then it really makes a lot of sense to use a effectively a, t a table format where you have headers, um, like close your eyes, imagine CSV, um, but different, differently encoded. Um, and so there's ways to do that, obviously, in JSON. Um, and uh, there's ways to do that with other encodings. Um, and my suggestion over there is to say, yeah, we should probably look at uh, Avro or Parquet as um, additional encoding formats specifically to satisfy that, that um, um, uh, that requirement, because because I think it's a real I think it's a real case. But then, if we want to send these these fairly large batches, then and I think we're gonna we're coming to the you know minimal maximum size thing. Um, then we should probably have an encoding that's um, that's more efficient and it's actually really good at these these time series batches. So that that much is a comment of of and probably AI bug issue that we should, should go and, and investigate. But I think it's a, this is a real, I think it's a real requirement, but I think it would, I find JSON a weird format to do this in because you have to kind of force it. Um, and, and you're just dealing with an idiosyncrasy of JSON in that it has the metadata with every field and uh, dealing with that with a more efficient format uh, is probably better. But I think the net of what you're saying there is that this is almost a, a different issue other than batching itself. This is a wholly separate sort of Correct. discussion point, right? Yes. I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's, it's a batch of, of individual records, but it's a, it's a different kind of, it's a time, it's a, it's a batch, but it's not um, a, you know, take an event in a particular shape and now send multiple of those, but you're literally starting with, I want to send time series data and here's a bunch of records. Right. So 
Let me ask this question. Is there anybody on the call who disagrees that this is a separate issue? Not, not passing judgment on whether it's a good or a bad idea, but just whether it should hold up this particular PR itself. Because I'm hearing, for, at least from Jim and now and Clemens, that they view this as a separate issue and it's not necessarily a blocking one for this. Is there anybody on the call who would disagree with that assessment? Okay, so let's do this. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, I will reach out to Doug and talk to him about that one. All right, is there anything else related to Christoph's PR then that people would like to bring up before we move on? All right, cool, thank you guys. Christoph, number two. So we talked about this the last two or three times. Uh, I'm not sure if I should do an intro again. So basically um, what it says is there is a minimum size that every implementation of cloud events has to support. I think today we want to discuss what the actual size is. Compared to last time, I added a big paragraph um, that kind of where I'm trying to explain the difference between the size of the event and then the size of the message. So we're tr what I'm trying to do here is to define the size on the event itself. And then you can encode that in one way or the other. So maybe you take AMQP and in AMQP it is encoded. The AMQP message is actually above 256 or whatever our limit will be. But you still have to accept it because the event contained in that message is larger. But if you uh make it smaller than that so if you if you would also uh, if you take a different event and serialize it in mqp and it would turn out it is below 250 kilobyte that is also no guarantee that it is being accepted because if you would serialize it as json it may turn out to be bigger um, so if you are a middleware that wants to guarantee that you can send the event on what you should always do is measure it in json if you're just concerned about like rejecting messages uh, so that you protect your own self, then you can take an sort of arbitrary limit that will fit any uh, 256 kilobyte or whatever limit, uh, Jason. I hope that made some sense. I uh, struggle a bit with that, explaining that uh, reasonably. I'm happy if someone, well, reads it over and make, maybe make some suggestions. Apart from that, uh, I think it's basically unchanged from last time. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments? Everybody okay with this 256K size? All right. I think Clemens wanted to um, <laughs> talk. Yeah, um, um, <laughs> are, you, are you telling me I should push back against it? <laughs> um, no. Well, I want to make sure that uh, you will end up supporting it. <laughs> yeah, I find 256K is, uh, um, that is, that is, uh, that's like four times the size of what we currently support on, on, on um, event grid. Um, these numbers are always totally arbitrary, which makes it kind of hard to go and argue for or against it because, you know, our 64K is, are as arbitrary as the 256K here. So having a rational argument for it is, um, uh, for or against it is kind of difficult. Um, the reason why we made it smaller is um, to force um, everything, that's, everything that's PII, and everything that's um, you know a binary file to force that either into a callback model um, or to uh, force a claim check pattern. So we it's it wasn't it's it's one one, one thing is obviously a scale concern um, of you know a torrent of met of messages that are floating around all at the same time and doing that at platform scale, which is a reason for why we do this in the event grid because EventGrid is a platform level capability um, that's there for all of Azure in one region. 
Um, and then the second is um, to literally keep the payloads size small um, so that um, you're effectively forcing everything that requires access control to view. Um, with that size limitation, we're making it fairly obvious that you should turn around and go to, back to the place um, and um, to the, effectively the, 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 the place that raised your, your event to get at stuff that requires access control, because that's one of the things from a privacy perspective. And this is, I'm just explaining to you the, the product rationale um, here. Um, from a privacy perspective, since PubSub is generally a thing where you are raising an event and then you have a bunch of parties being able to subscribe without having differentiated access control, you probably don't want to include too much detail into that event that you're raising, but just effectively including just enough information with that event for that other party to know whether it's relevant for them. And if they need to have further detail, they just turn around and walk up to the, the sender and there they run into an access control gate. And if, there's, if they're not authorized to see whatever personally identifiable data, et cetera, um, then they won't get at it. Um, so we have, based on those considerations, we've been landing at uh, 64K being a fairly reasonable limit. Okay, so uh, Jim, you have your hand up? <clears throat> Yeah, I do. Hey, I'm masquerading as Vladimir at the moment. Um, <laughs> so I, I agree with what, uh, what Clemens is saying. I, I guess I'd like to hear from some of the people that were arguing for larger messages originally. I believe they sort of had IoT use cases where you know, claim checks may not work for them. Um, so I, I, I understand you know, Clemens's point, um, I just want to make sure whatever limit we put on, you know, is going to support those use cases that people were concerned about. And, and again, I would add it's better to start with a lower limit than, and raise it than try and start with a higher limit and then wind it back because that would never work. Um, about that, I want to say I don't think raising it works either because if it's a minimum support size and you have a pipeline supporting only version one, any middleware in the middle of it supporting only version one, you'll only be guaranteed the smallest smallest size that was ever specified in your major version. That's a fair comment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I can't remember who it was. Doug, can you remember who was asking from an IoT perspective? Unfortunately, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Is there anybody on the call who'd like to chime in about that? So, I, so I, I'll, I'll sort of raise my hand then. Um, two things that run through my mind is, I'm nervous about the first thing I'm about to say because I actually like having strong words in there, but the must there. From an interoperability perspective, obviously a must is the right way to go. However, on something like this, where we know there are some systems out there that can only support things that are smaller, um, should this be a strongly recommended instead of a must? Or do we lose something because people will use the out and, the, and it won't mean anything at that point? That's one thing that's running through my mind. So um, the other, I, Sorry, I was going to say, are you advocating for a must support 64K, but is recommended to support 256? Honestly, my original thought was just to replace the must with, with strongly recommended. So not, not change the size, but just change it to strongly recommended. But then my other question was directly towards Clemens, which is, Clemens, are you advocating that we explicitly change it to two, from, from 256 to 64? Um, I, I would, so if this was a strongly recommended, that would give me a pass to ignore it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's what I'm, I like it and I'm afraid of it at the same time. <laughs> um, well, I'm, so my, 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 my product considerations don't go away, um, uh, but I understand the limit. So I, I like strongly recommended better because there are factually systems where um, they will, which will want to be um, cloud event subscribers. Like for instance, 
we have this thing called um, uh, you know IoT Edge, um, and uh, we want to go and use cloud events effectively everywhere and also kind of in the embedded space. And I'm um, I'm trying in the in the industrial um, space um, also to um, convince some other standards groups to use cloud events, and I know that there will be limited constrained areas where we can probably just barely fit a cloud event even into a transfer frame. And um, ha having a recommendation here is for you know, the, the general broad, everybody is in the cloud um, um, the area of having recommendation there um, is certainly better than a must where it's then becomes fairly impossible to go and do a compliant implementation for these cases at, at the edge and embedded system. Right. And, and, those, and those folks are um, relatively humorless when it comes to normative language. <laughs> humorless, I like that phrase. That's yes. Uh, but, um, in that case, shouldn't we then just say must be uh, 64 kilobyte then because I think then I like the strong language and then r having a lower limit than basically having, or how would I say that? So I'm the guy who sends events and I need to make sure for my customers that they arrive. If they don't arrive, then I am the one that has the problem. <laughs> so basically yeah. I need to guarantee that my events will throw through the platform or whatever they put behind my software system. Um, so for me that, I don't really care what the limit is. I just want to make sure it is there. Yeah, the, the reason why a must, why a really hard rule is um, is difficult is that the further you look down into the into different systems, the smaller your sizes get that you can support. And I think there's still applicability for cloud events in that case. So let's say if you wanted to go and make cloud events work on TSN, which is time sensitive networking which is a, if nobody has heard about that, um, it's a way to create an ethernet setup, which gives you guaranteed hard real time over ethernet with an extra layer of hardware and software pieces. But you can literally, if you say, I want to have the message, a message over at this other place in one microsecond, it happens in exactly one microsecond. And, um, and so the TSN layer does that, but TSN is not, IP, it's not TCP, it's none of those things, you basically just get transport frames. And the transport frame you get to use is one and a half K, which fits in a cloud event, especially if we add, if we add a, a binary encoding, for instance, with protobuf. Um, but then, you know, you're literally constrained to, to whatever else you can put into that payload, which might be sufficient or is sufficient for some, some real-time applications. So there's, there's you know, the further you further down at the edge you go, the smaller the sizes get, um, which makes it really hard for us to kind of make. We need, I think, we need to have a general interoperability rule, which is true for you know all of us cloud people who do the the pass and the Kubernetes and, and et cetera and all that all of that, but then kind of leave an out for people who are working on on those set, on those kinds of systems and don't feel repelled from rules like that. Are you implying that any minimum size uh, would be a problem, basically? Um, I, th yeah, I, th I mean, I mean, if I if I take a look at the, the TSN T TSN case, then you are then you are effectively at the, the the maximum transfer unit size, right, for Ethernet. Okay. What do other people think? It seems like we're we're, we're zeroing in on two possible choices. Um, change the must to a strongly recommended or potentially reduce the size? Or is there another option out there? So I'm not hearing anybody complain too much about this direction in general. It's just tweaks at this point. I've got I mean, big tweaks, but or important tweaks, but still I'm not hearing anybody object to this general direction. So is there another option people can think of a, a poor, or point of discussion? The I other... Think. I was, I'm sorry, go ahead, Christoph. Go, go Christoph. I wasn't sure if Kathy was going to speak. In my initial issue months ago, I also laid up the idea that um, I'm not sure if it's so good. 
that we could have like several layers. So you support a spec version and then you support, I don't know, cloud event 64 kilobytes or one megabyte or one kilobyte. So you could more or less um, explicitly say what you support. And then if you build up the system, you plug in, you have to make sure that you plug in the right part. So it doesn't make sense to plug in a producer who does one megabyte events uh, into a TSN system that only consumes one kilobyte. So instead of having one set limit, you can sort of choose or declare what you have. Well, it also adds a lot of complexity. Um, I'm not sure if it's worth it, but it's uh, one idea. Yeah, those basically become profiles is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard different people have different reactions to profiles. Some people probably okay with it and I've other people go screaming from the room when you mention profiles because they think back to the days of the, the WS star standards, especially around security, when you had different profiles and that was great. Everybody was compliant with their own profile. <laughs> so you had zero interoperability. <laughs> I'm sure Clement okay. remembers those days. <laughs> Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, um, Some of the longest, so I think the longest constant in the .NET framework is um, one of those profiles. Yeah. All right. And is there anybody else who hasn't really spoken up that would like to speak up? Okay. So I'm not quite sure how to move forward on here because um, I, I Granted, this is my completely biased opinion, but it seems like I'm hearing good arguments on both sides for both possible changes. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure how to move forward there. Because I, I don't want to just come down to a vote. That doesn't seem like the right thing to do on this one. I mean, obviously we have to, we will, but... Um, I don't know, I'm looking for ideas on how you guys want to move forward on this one. Do you guys want more time to think about it? Do you want to put the two choices up for a vote and see where the group tends to land or it seems to prefer? Um, uh, I would suggest maybe um, give you one more, give you more time, one more week for people to think about this. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the transport and the event consumer is other ones that, you know, I need to be compliant with to support these sites, right? This is a, basically the, the size that need to be supported um, as the event goes along the way, it goes all the way to the eventual event consumer. So all the middleware and the, and the final event consumer need to support the size. Um, I, I would like to go for the direction that we can start with a smaller size and then see how that goes. Um, Okay. Well, so, uh, okay, so Kathy, you, you expressed an opinion or a preference in there, so thank you for that. But then you also suggested that maybe give people a little more time to think about it. And I, I like the idea of giving little, people a little more time, mainly because I don't think this is critical that has to go in today, because I don't think that this is necessarily going to change implementation code. This is more about setting guidelines for knowledgeability. So I think we have a little bit of wiggle room relative to time on this. Uh, what if we do this? What if we um, give another week for people to think about it. I will send out a note to the group expressing the two different sort of options that we sort of thought about on this particular call and asking for people to either come with their, with their preferred uh, choice on next week's call or if they can't make the call to express that opinion through email or through the PR itself. Um, and then maybe on next week's call we could look at some sort of start of a vote, if nothing else, maybe at a bare minimum, a sort of sense of preference for which direction we'd like to go um, and see how that takes us. Like I said, I'd, I'd like to try to avoid too much of a formal vote on this because I don't think it's necessarily contentious and I don't think there's, a, there's an obvious answer out there. Um, but what do you think we would think about starting with that? Sort of come back next week and give you a chance to think about it a little more and then try to force some sort of decision next week. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I have a question. You say two options. Are you do you mean two options, different size, or do you mean that one option is we set aside the other option is like mentioned before? You we use some profile, use some messaging sync up. You know, 
on the, I mean, to the, decide on the size. The two, the two choices that were mentioned was to decrease the size here. I think the proposal was to decrease it to 64K. And then the other option mentioned was to change the must to something like a strongly recommended. Oh, okay, I see. That way people do have an out if they need to, but we really, really, really want you to stick to a size that we, that we pick, which is 256 as of right now. Could we also get some input from somebody who's doing IoT and considering cloud events? Uh, Clemens mentioned uh, people doing TSN, was it? And I don't necessarily, well, no, this is mean. Uh, <laughs> No, if uh, IoT uh, producers would are much more likely to use their own system instead of cloud events, uh, setting a lower limit that might uh, impact uh, cloud producers where we have higher limits might not be worth it. But if there is actual IoT interest for this, obviously a lower limit is good. It's kind of a mean comment, but we kind of have to take this in consideration too. Like, aren't IoT and Edge um, the producers most li more likely to use a uh, proprietary event system and event format? Obviously, we do want interoperability, but still. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're running a little bit long time here. So I think the idea you had there, that was a good one. That I, I think a lot of people on the call do have either customers or work with other people in other areas like IoT sector and stuff like that. So maybe we can use this week to try to reach out to some of our colleagues and friends and see if they have any opinions on this and we can bring those to, to the next week's call. Is that fair? Okay, but with that, what I'd like to do is to, to move on and, and see if we can wrap this up next week, so give people a week to think about it. But with the short time that we have, what I'd like to do is ask Christoph to quickly introduce his claim check thing and then Rachel, maybe you could give us uh, a minute or two overview of your PR as well. Both of those are relatively new, um, so I, I wasn't going to push for a vote or anything like that today, but I did want to at least get the ideas out there for people to talk about them so people can start thinking about it. So, Christoph, maybe you could summarize this one. Yeah, so this is basically the claim check pattern. So, um, there's a new att attribute next to the data that's called data ref, and that's basically a reference to where you can also get the same data. So you can have both at the same time or only one. Um, and there are basically three use cases for it that are outlined here. The first one is the content is too large, uh, basically what we discussed before. Um, so if it's too large, you put it into a different place and then the consumer can retrieve it. In that case, uh, it would probably, be, or it could be public. <clears throat> and then the two other cases are more security related. The first one is that you want to verify that the data hasn't been tampered with. So you would retrieve it again, maybe it's supplicated, and then you would check that it's really the same and, and you trust that source. Um, and the other is uh, that Vince also talked about today. Um, you have some personally identif identifiable information in there. Uh, you don't trust all um, middleware between it. So only a trusted consumer can retrieve it. So you don't put the data into your message, you only put in the data ref, and then only the trusted consumer has the secret to view it. Yep. And then I'm being pretty open-ended. I'm just saying it's a URI reference and then have fun with that. Um, there's also, well, on purpose, there is nothing inside the message so that you can authenticate at that point. Um, the idea is that in a, one way or the other, the secret has to be pretty sure. Um, yep, that's the overview, I think. Okay. So as I said, not going to push for a vote, but are there any high level questions or comments about this that you'd like to share at this point in time? I'm not sure why that, that's a first class thing and why that's not just in, inside the data, because the event could be not only about one context, but, but about many, and then you're, um, um, or many aspects of a context, and then you have you know, the distinction between a thing where you can only have one URI versus a payload where you then need two, and then, and then you, 
breaking it out into a so it's it's not it's not clear that that needs to be first class first class uh, object. I want to make sure I understood you, Clemens. There, are you suggesting that another alternative would be to have a data content type uh, <clears throat> that implies a claim check pattern? So that way, the the data yeah, I mean, the data I mean, value I mean, itself is the your is basically the URL or a set of URLs. Yeah, you have a yeah, you have a you have a you have an, an object, and the object describes uh, effectively has has a pointer to um, whatever you want to um, uh, you know refer to. Hmm. It, it's it. I find this. I find it. I find it a little constraining as a, as a first class um, construct. Okay. Anybody else have any comments? People are commenting in chat. Oh. Is claim check about eventing in pattern or is that messaging? Oh gosh, messaging versus eventing discussion. <laughs> That's like begging for a a a seminar from Clemens. <laughs> um, no, I think it's I think it's legitimate. Um, I, I actually, I think it's very legitimate. If you have a um, a single large, so you have a large document, and you want to tell the world about that large document, it would be um, unwise to go and send a, cop a copy of that large document to everybody. But rather, you want to go and just inform them that just something happened with that large document, and you want to point people to it. So I think this is legit, um, uh, general as a pattern anyways. It's just that for me, the data, like the data ref one URI thing is, I'm not sure um, that adds a lot over um, just having data, uh, a data field with a URI inside of it. And, and then the, the flexibility to have, you know, further metadata, metadata that explains what that means. Okay. So, uh... 30 more seconds. Any high level questions? Uh, Clemens, I'm assuming you can make your comment that you just made into the PR itself so other people can comment and think about what you said. I, can I just butt in one comment since we've got yeah. 20 seconds left? Yeah, please, Jim, go ahead. Uh, oh, shoot. I was just trying to remember what I was trying to say. Um, <laughs> data, <laughs> data is, uh, um, oh, I'm going to show my ignorance. Data is essentially an opaque blob, though, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. I mean, um, I, I guess to Clemens, the question would be, how can it either be an opaque blob or a, a reference to something else? Uh, it, doesn't that make it not very well typed? Or maybe I missed the thrust of what, what, what you were uh, oh. advocating for. Um, yeah, if, if uh, um, well, I, I, th I think if you receive the event and then what you do, is do you blindly pull the the uh, you know ten megabyte payload without knowing what it is, um, or do you rather have in the data um, some description of what that might be and but that's application specific, and then you make a decision of whether you want to pull it or not. Because that's really that's really the difference here, right? You here we're saying. There's a payload that might be of arbitrary size, and um, we're not going to tell you what it is, but you have to go and get at it. While oh. you, if you make it a prop, if you make it an up, part of the event payload and say aspects of this payload might be elsewhere, and you're including your eyes to those aspects, okay, um, making it more explicit. That's 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 why. Like I'm not I'm not in principle opposed to you know having the payload uh, as external and using that reference just from a from a practical perspective um i'm not sure i would use it okay so for you it's more than i need more information as to whether i should want to follow this link at this time yeah it, and and that's so for me that's a that's so i'm not doing i'm not my answer is not based on some protocol principle but it's based on you know what is my what what do i think about as an application use case of, of whether i would use that feature Right. Okay. All right. Okay. So with that, uh, please come in, make, put your comments or your idea into the PR, and we can start uh, having offline discussions about that. But very quickly, Rachel, uh, I'd like you to, if possible, summarize your PR here on creative space for specs for proprietary protocols, if you may, or if you can. Sure. So the PR, as I opened it, is extremely permissive. It 
says anyone who would like to add a spec for their propri proprietary protocol or encoding can do so by adding a spec that looks like any other spec for any other protocol in a special place and explaining what this protocol is used for. The comment that I got yesterday, which is an interesting comment, um, is that we should perhaps have a higher bar for proprietary specs, that we should ask them to prove that if a cloud event, uh, if a cloud event um, goes in and then comes back out, it is still in the same format. Um, I think that's a pretty high bar, but I'm open to that if people want that. Um, so that's that's the status. Okay. I'm going to leave it open for a week because it's like it hasn't gotten very many comments. Yeah, no, I, th I think from a procedure point of view is that DCO needs to be signed or the, the commit needs to be signed. That's right. Yeah. Um, but any, any high order questions for Rachel? Yeah, I, I read that comment too. Um, and I found that I found, found the argument fairly convincing. And that is, um, and I have, I made another comment somewhere else, uh, specifically on the rocket MQPR that kind of goes in the same direction. And that is, um, I think, I think the question is, is that spec that lives in our repo useful for anybody outside of that project? Um, and, and how does that, how does that spec in our repo help interoperability? I think that's, um, that's, that's this comment that where that. So when you say, when you say anyone outside that project, do you mean anyone who's not developing that project or do you mean anyone who's yeah. not using that so, project? So, so let me, let me, let me use the rocket MQ example just because it's, it's good to illustrate that point. You gotta be quick comments cause we're running out of time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, because, so they don't have, they don't seem to have, have a proper protocol spec. They literally just have code. And so there's, there's nothing that a binding could really refer to except for, you know, a, a version of the code. And then the, there can't be any compatible, a, a compatible interoperable, you know, version of the protocol because it's only documented in the code. So then the question for me is, what is the value of that map of the binding? If that only refers to something that's inside of their project, then it becomes really just an adver advertising surface more than anything else. Okay, and okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut people off there because I wanna be respectful of people's time. It's, it's, it is the top of the hour. So just a quick last uh, attendance check. Joe, are you there? Joe Sherman? Okay, what about uh, Christian? Right here. Okay, uh, L-I-G-I-A, Ligia? Or what about Erica? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, and what about Eric? I'm here. Okay, uh, Joe, are you there? I'm in. Joe Sherman? And Ligia, L-I-G-I-A? I'm here. Okay, thank you. Hey, Doug, this is Joe Sherman, I'm here. Hey, Joe, got you, okay. Anybody else I missed from the attendee list? I think I got everybody. All right, cool, thank you guys very much, and I apologize for running over one minute. Thank you guys, we'll talk next week. Um, Clemens, so we, we have this call in, in an hour, right? About the other, and I have two call, two calls between between now and then, but we'll meet at here, right here in an okay. hour. Well, we have it, and we don't postpone it for the other guys who actually opened the issue. Uh, well, we can. I haven't heard from any of them. Well, they wrote something in the actual PR. Well, let me look at it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, uh, well, we'll, we'll meet and we can go and postpone then. All right. Yeah. Okay. Bye. And see you later.